you know, we inherited a, an economy that was in tough shape. Uh, a $2.4 billion deficit in the entire calendar year of 2013, only 1,300 jobs have been created. We've seen uh, ravaging from budget cuts and sequestration had really caused our economy problems. Ralph and I and Mark Herring, with the work of a lot of great legislators, said we need to get to work to build the new Virginia economy, and I am proud to stand here today uh, whereas we inherited a gigantic deficit, we are leaving a gigantic surplus as, as we leave office with over 200,000 folks employed over the course of the last four years. Unemployment has gone from 5.4 uh, all the way down to 3.7%. We are a new state. We're a cyber state. We're a bio state. We're an unmanned system state. We're a Google energy state. We're a data analytics state. Uh, we are in great shape today, and we need to continue to move in that great progress uh, that we have done. Over the course of the last four years, a record investment in K-12, a billion dollars. We now have a world-class public education system here in the great Commonwealth of Virginia. We work very hard to keep our communities safe, and we have leaned in to make sure that Virginia is open and welcoming to everyone. Where we had a lot of tremendous success in the last few years with the legislature on economic development, on issues of transportation and education. We did have a few vetoes over the course of the last four years, 120 to be exact, to make sure that we will not tolerate any prejudices against women, discrimination, LGBT members hurt our environment, or roll back voting rights. So as we move forward, and I presented the final budget uh, to the Budget Committee the other day, as you can see, it fully funds all of our priorities, a record investment in, in our cash reserves, and. Uh, You'll see our rainy day fund, and in fact, the budget that you will see will even be greater because of the announcement that, that I will make tomorrow about the first six months of the year, even doing better than any of us had anticipated. So it's a great budget. It's a budget that lays out the priorities that Ralph and I have worked on over the course of the, the last four years. It also funds what needs for WMATA, and it is fiscally sound. It does also include Medicaid expansion, which I've talked about, and Ralph and I have fought so hard over the course of the last four years. It is time to stop the politics. It's time to do the right thing. It's time to show moral leadership, and it's time to get health care for 400,000 Virginians who desperately need it. As you know, they make too much for our lean existing Medicaid program and not enough to pay for it themselves. We cannot continue to go forward and forfeit $2.2 billion a year. That is $6.6 million per day. It is time to do the right thing, create 30,000 new jobs, save our rural hospitals, and do the right thing. So as you see the budget, it's, as I say, it's fiscally sound. But Ralph and I have also worked on several other key issues uh, as we go forward. So we've talked about what legislation will be introduced in the upcoming session. It's a starting point on many of these different issues, but on the first issue of gun safety, uh, that's a very important issue to both Ralph and myself. I was very proud of the historic uh, <coughs> announcement we were able to do in 2016, the first comprehensive gun legislation in 24 years we were able to pass, uh, working in a bipartisan way. Those individuals under a protective order have 24 hours to hand in their firearms or they will face a class six felony. They will lose their <coughs> weapons and be put in jail. And that was a bipartisan work that we all did. We need to take it to the next step. So you will see legislation calling for universal background checks. It is the right thing to do. It's critical for our communities, for the safety of our communities. As you know, currently only federally licensed firearm dealers are required to obtain the results of a background check, which means the private sellers don't have to do it. In 2017, the Virginia State Police reported a total of 3,584 firearms purchases through federally licensed firearms dealers that were rejected. So if we had 3,500 that were rejected at federal dealers, think how many were going to private sellers. And you know that many of those 3,500, when they were rejected at the federal dealer, went to a private dealer. We need to shut that down. It's critical for the safety of our communities. We cannot let this go on any further. We had last year in the Commonwealth of Virginia 1,050 firearms-related deaths in the Commonwealth of Virginia. This is a very common-sense step. The next thing we'll be advocating for is absentee voting, something Ralph and I have leaned in for the last four years to try and get done. 
Why is it we make it difficult for people to go vote on election day? We should make it easy. So what we are proposing is in-person absentee voting can go on 21 days within 21 days of the election. It doesn't change existing as it is by mail, but in-person, 21 days within the election, you can walk in and you can absentee vote without needing any excuses at all. This will break down the lines that we have on election day. The idea that folks are forced to go on a given Tuesday with long lines and many individuals, two or three jobs, it makes it very difficult. We want everybody to be able to vote. This is a common sense step. Right now in the country, uh, you can do it in 30 other states. We need to join those 30 other states and do the right thing here. We need to think uh, we are the beacon of democracy in all of the history that has occurred in this very building and has occurred in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is time to show leadership, to show we are out front on democracy, and that's why we need to move forward to this very important piece of legislation. In addition, as you know, we have taken action on Reggie, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. This is very important. I'm very proud to say that when I did sign Executive Directive Number 11, that we were the first Southern state to put a cap on carbon and participate in the Reggie formula structure. When I signed Executive Directive Number 11, I required the Department of Environmental Quality to begin the process of drafting regulations enabling Virginia to develop a carbon reduction program for power plants under DEQ's existing authority. This program will link to the broader carbon market established through Reggie. However, as under what I've done through executive authority, we cannot auction the allowances directly because we do not have an appropriation from the General Assembly. Instead, the regulation uses what's called a consignment auction where the utilities will hold the revenue. The legislation that we are proposing would enable the Commonwealth to directly auction the allowances and invest the revenue in programs that, here in the General Assembly, would then be able to make that decision. We will move forward with a carbon reduction program that links to the broader Reggie market regardless. This will go forward. The steps we're taking will give the General Assembly an opportunity to weigh in on how that revenue is actually allocated. As you know, participation in a broader market will allow Virginia to reduce costs and drive more investments in renewable energy and energy efficiency, while also decreasing our carbon emissions and mitigating the impacts related to climate change. The next piece of legislation will be the elimination of candidates and elected office holders from being able to use their campaign funds for personal use. This is something that we have proposed every year. Uh, as you know, when I came into office four years ago, executive order number two, we put a broad ban on myself, my family, and every person in our administration. They were capped at a $100 gift. It was a step in the right direction. As you know, I also asked 10 highly respected men and women to serve on the Commission on Integrity and Public Confidence in State Government. That bipartisan panel put forth a series of substantive recommendations. We have worked productively <coughs> with the General Assembly to reform the Commonwealth ethics systems and the reforms that we have passed so far, including a cap on gifts that can be accepted from lobbyists, I believe has contributed to a new culture of accountability here in Richmond. Today, we are proposing to build on those bipartisan achievements by strengthening the law yet again. This proposal will ensure that campaign contributions cannot be used by political candidates and elected officials for personal use. This common sense reform is one of the several recommended by the Integrity Commission and unfortunately has been fought every year by the General Assembly. This legislation will send a clear message to the public that their leaders in Richmond should be accountable to all Virginians. Next, the felony threshold, something we have worked on for the last four years, is something, as you know, I am very, very passionate about. Currently, as you know, our threshold for larceny is, felony larceny is $200. Unfortunately, we are now tied for the lowest in the country. We are tied with New Jersey, and in my conversations with Governor-elect of New Jersey, Phil Murphy, I do believe that New Jersey will be moving away from it, leaving Virginia the lowest in the country. It does not make any sense. It means if you're an 18-year-old who steals an iPhone today, you will be branded as a felon in Virginia for the rest of your life. That figure has not changed since 1980. 
and I guess looking around the room, many of you weren't even born in 1980. Fifteen other states in America have thresholds of $500 to $950, and 30 states have thresholds of at least $1,000. Virginia should do the same. That is why we will propose that Virginia raise its felony larceny threshold to $1,000, ensuring that fewer people will be ensnared in this lifelong punishment for making a small mistake. It does not mean that we condone crime and theft, but I do believe that even though people make mistakes, they should not be afforded a meaningful and be given a second chance in life, something that we have leaned in very hard. The other legislation we'll be proposing is a Bowers Bill of Rights. <clears throat> we need to give Virginians the tools to manage student debt and hold predatory lenders accountable by passing a Bowers Bill of Rights, creating a state ombudsman for student loans. Today, believe it or not, over one million Virginians owe over $30 billion today. This debt threatens families' financial security and hold back our economy because people delay their decisions to buy a home, buy a car, save for retirement, or start their own business. When students borrow money for their education, they deserve honest, transparent, and timely information about those loans. But too often, they are misled or deceived by their student loan companies. The solution is to institute a Bowers Bill of Rights that requires student loan servicers in Virginia to follow common sense rules and obtain a license from the Bureau of Financial Institutions like practically every other financial institution has to do. By establishing an, establishing an ombudsman within SHEV, we could help borrowers understand that the payment options and keep them on track and in turn protecting their financial futures. Before I close, I also want to mention a bill we expect to be introduced this session called the Whole Woman's Health Act, which will make it easier for women to access reproductive health care and roll back attempts, any attempts to go between a health care decision that should be made between a woman and her doctor. I've been proud to stand as a brick wall with Ralph and Attorney General Herring to protect women from attacks against their constitutional rights. It's one of the first actions we took to replace the Board of Health when we took office four years ago, as you know, through the TRAP regulations, they were shutting down all the women's clinics here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We stopped that. We kept our clinics open, and I'm very proud the other day we just opened a new facility in Virginia Beach. But we can and should do more to roll back policies that are already on the books that are designed to interfere with women's personal health care decisions. So we are hopeful that each of these proposals can start a positive conversation and move solutions forward on these issues by working with Governor Northam, his team, and the General Assembly. We do recognize that there are many other good answers to these challenges, and we hope the General Assembly will go beyond the recommendations that we are making today. The intent of our announcement today is to lay out where we believe should be first steps on tackling these critical issues and lay a foundation for future progress. Together with my budget proposal and these policy ideas, we build upon the vision of to continue to have a prosperous Virginia for all. Finally, I do want to recognize my policy director, Jenny O'Hanlon, who will stay on as the uh, governor-elect's uh, <laughs> policy director. She is not with us today. As you know, she just had a new baby boy. <laughs> so we want to wish Jenny, uh, Kevin, and everybody the best wishes and look forward to having her back. I now would like to turn it over to the governor-elect and the 73rd governor of the Commonwealth of Virginia. I will say finally, it has been an honor to serve with Ralph over the last four years. I will tell you, this has been the smoothest, easiest transition in Virginia history. Um, we've been great friends. Our wives have been great friends. We have been great family friends. And we have been in sync on all these legislative issues. And it has been an honor as governor to work with the greatest lieutenant governor in Virginia history. <laughs> And as we roll out our 2018 legislative package, first of all, I'd like to commend Governor McCulloch and his first lady wife, Dorothy, for their leadership over the last four years. As, as the governor just uh, uh, articulated, we, we came into our office four years ago with a significant uh, budget deficit, and we are leaving with a significant surplus, and that's something that we can all be proud of, and I, I commend you for building the new Virginia economy and leaving Virginia just really in, in wonderful shape as we move forward uh, over the next four years. Uh, we have worked on this legislative package. It is 
uh, nonpartisan. It is common sense. It is something that I think we will have support from both sides of the aisle. And these are issues uh, that we ran on uh, in 2017. And as you all know, on the 7th of November, Virginia spoke. Uh, and they supported th this legislative package that we're going to move forward. And I would like to highlight two areas. The first is gun violence in the Commonwealth of Virginia. As the governor said, we lost over a thousand Virginians last year uh, to gun-related deaths. And that's something that we should all find is unacceptable. That's more individuals that will die on our, our highways in Virginia, and we, we can't allow that. And just a couple of statistics that uh, recently came out from the CDC, the Center for Disease uh, uh, in, in uh, Atlanta, uh, in Virginia, uh, our suicide rate from gun-related uh, accidents uh, went up 21% over the last decade. Uh, homicides from guns went up 59% in the last five years. So uh, we support uh, common sense gun legislation. We support uh, responsible gun ownership, and I believe that we will have bipartisan support for that as we move forward. The second issue that I want to uh, outline is something that the governor said we have worked on for the last four years, and that is Medicaid expansion. And for four, close to 400,000 working Virginians not having access to health care coverage is, is uh, something that we find is unacceptable, and we look forward to expanding Medicaid. And you know, you know, uh, as you have heard me speak before, I am from rural Virginia. We have hospitals in rural Virginia now that are operating in the red. Uh, we have an opioid crisis. Uh, that is uh, alive and well, unfortunately, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so it is very, very important uh, that we expand Medicaid. And our budget includes that, uh, over $400 million in the biennial budget. Uh, and this is money that we'll be able to we'll bring back to the Commonwealth of Virginia, used for rural Virginia, used to make our hospitals uh, whole again and to fight the opioid crisis. So uh, I look forward to leading that discussion as we move forward. And, and finally, again, I, I would just like to thank the governor. And this is a, a legislative package that we have both been working on. It is a start. Uh, I look forward to a good debate uh, as we move forward with both the House and the Senate. Uh, as you know, we have a very tight makeup in both the House and the Senate. So I believe in Virginia we have a unique opportunity uh, to work in a bipartisan way and do some great things for the Commonwealth of Virginia in the next four years. So thank you, and we'll be glad to take questions. A couple questions. 